Hello, folks. If it's Friday, it's got to be History Day, hasn't it? Chris Green, the history chap. Uh, lovely to see you all. And uh, this is the uh, my normal little delve into British history on a Friday afternoon, or at least Friday afternoon here in the UK. And uh, you know, really looking back at what what events happened in British history this week. So uh, that well, that's the framework at any rate. Um, so welcome to you all. It's lovely to already see, well, we've got 14 people already joining us. We're 30 seconds in. That's fantastic. Um, hello, Bill. Um, hope you, well, you said darn, darn poor health. Well, I hope you're feeling a little bit better or on the road to improvement. Hello, Leslie, as well. Greetings to you over in South Carolina. And also greetings to Jen Ingle. Lovely to see you. And you're in Cumbria, Jen. So uh, beautiful part of the world. Anyone who doesn't doesn't know the UK, when you're on uh, when you come over here on a trip, don't just go to London and Stratford. Try and find some of the other beautiful areas like the Lake District, Cumbria, where Jen lives, and indeed like uh, Cornwall over there. That, that picture there, that's on the North Cornish coast. That's a photograph I took uh, back on New Year's Day, and it looks lovely. I have to say, it was really blinking windy that day. Anyway, oh hello, Sarah Jane over in Bletchley, uh, Dalton Weeks. Lovely to see you as well. Thanks for your support, mate. Always give a shout out to people who are supporting me. Likewise, Jen as a patron. Thank you very much indeed. Carlisle is great, says 73 North. It is. Um, yeah, I've, I've been there a few times in the past. Uh, cracking Castle and um, had a great curry there as well. So there you go. You wouldn't go all the way to Cumbria for a curry, but I did. Harry, lovely to see you. And again, a member of my uh, my membership channel here. So thank you very much indeed. Wow, now we're all on. Uh, Charlie Manson. Hello, North Yorkshire. Martin Buckley. Sonny Oldham. If you say so, mate. Uh, Terry Murphy in Cincinnati. Hello to you. Uh, oh, Charlie Manson is saying you're born in Carlisle, even though you're in North Yorkshire now. So lovely to see you. So, folk, as you can guess from the chat, uh, by all means, stick in where you are in the world. I always love to know. It's one of those. It, try, it try, drives Sarah up the, up the wall, actually, because we were driving along and I'll be saying, oh, do you know, down that road there, oh, that village, that reminds me. I do, I do really love to know about, I've got a sense of geography as well as a, a love for history. So there you go. Um, for those of you, hello, Don, as well, over in uh, Texas. Great to see you. And we've got Cincinnati calling. Wow. We've got all sorts of uh, folk coming in here. Thank you. Uh, and Leslie, I've travelled the entirety of the British Isles. Do you know what, Leslie? You've probably done more uh, from South Carolina than um, uh, most people in Britain have done, if I'm honest. Um, we seem to always, everyone in Britain goes off on European, you know, on European breaks and off on city breaks to Prague and Paris and everywhere else. And then you say, have you been to Ludlow? I mean, you know, here's a classic. I've never been to Glasgow, driven past Glasgow, driven through Glasgow, never spent any time in Glasgow. You know, one of the biggest cities in Britain. Um, yeah, likewise, Sarah. My partner's ne never been to Norfolk, you know. So there are loads of beautiful parts of, of the UK, and we probably don't get to enough of them. So hello. Uh, for those of you who've never been on a live call before, if you're expecting uh, lovely videos and all that stuff that I normally put out, uh, this isn't that. This is this is an informal chat, okay? And we, we tend to chat for the uh, best part of an hour. Obviously, you, you're not obliged to be in all that time. And... Uh, Join in the conversation, please, because um, that's what it's all about. It's it's a different, different bit of history, different way of sharing my love and passion for history um, over and above the, the what YouTube call the long form videos. Speaking of which, of course, had a we've I've had a busy week. Uh, the long form video earlier this week, of course, we had the part two of the storming of the Taku Forts in China in 1860. Uh, and I don't know, have, have folks seen that video? It's um, if, if I'm honest, I thought the Storm of the Taco Forts would be uh, more popular than they've been. No rhyme or reason. No rhyme or reason. Uh, who would have thought that the Battle of Omdurman would be one of my one of my best videos? Um, forgotten War in the Sudan. You, you'd think that um, Taco Forts would have been good. And of course, some of you helped me decide whether the Taco Forts was going to be a one long video or two short well, or divide it into two and I went for the division into two <laughs> maybe I got it wrong but in fairness if it had been one video it probably would have been about 50 minutes some people love sitting down for 50 minutes other people like short and sweet I guess there's no uh, you can't please everyone all the time so uh, they, 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 there you go so um, yeah I don't know if, uh, did, did, folk, did folk enjoy the taco forts 
the fact that Sir Garnet Wolseley nearly got beheaded. I mean, I, I love those, those moments in history, you know. And it was just one of those classics, wasn't it? There he was, faffing about, sketching sketching maps in North uh, in, in northern China. And uh, Sir, Sir Harry Park, or Harry Parks as he was then, needed a, an escort. And, of course, Captain Brabazon from the Hussars decided to leap in because uh, Garnet Wolseley was faffing about uh, making maps. And they all got abducted by the Chinese. And, of course, Brabazon was, was beheaded. And, you know, there for that moment in history, Garnet Wolseley could have been the man being beheaded and how history would have been different, wouldn't it? Um, you know, if you if you uh, if you just think about what happened with Garnet Wolseley afterwards, uh, Red River Expedition in Canada, the Ashanti War. Of course, he then formed the Ashanti Ring of Officers. They, they would never have coalesced together around Wolseley. He wouldn't have been there, would he? Uh, and then, of course, you know, uh, Wolseley uh, famously came in last minute at the Zulu Wars. But then obviously his big high point was Egypt, Battle of Tel el-Kabir. And then, of course, uh, well, he sort of ran into the sand a bit, pardon the pun, in North African desert because he uh, he wanted to lead the expedition to rescue his friend Charles Gordon from Khartoum. And, uh, of course, you know, all of that history would have been very different. Might have still happened, just wouldn't have had Garnet Wolseley and all his spins on it. Uh, but interestingly, of course, Gordon, Charles Gordon partly went to Khartoum because his friend Garnet Wolsey encouraged him to go there. So not just thinking about what would the Nile expedition have been like if Garnet Wolsey hadn't been in charge, but fairly, you know, you could argue, argue would, would Gordon have gone back to Khartoum? I think, think he probably would have, actually, because he, he sort of had a love affair with Sudan and with the Sudanese people. But, um, and, and, and he generally had this thing for the downtrodden. So I think he probably would have gone. Well, I stand to be corrected. Don't know what people think. Anyway, how? what are we saying? What are folks saying here in the... Uh, hello from Indonesia. Wow, I don't think I've had an Indonesian person on before, so thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, Veronica. Um, crash plane from German photos. Sarah Jane, I've done my own bit of research this week. A World War, ti World War II pilot we knew. I found his crash plane from German photos. Oh wow! You got to you got to tell us a bit more about that, Sarah Jane. That sounds fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Um, Jen Ingalls has seen the Taku Forts. Uh, I, I think. Oh, sorry, Taku Forts video. Do beg your pardon. I thought you'd been there, uh, Jen. Uh, you didn't think they were going to be interesting, but you found it fascinating. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you very much. And in fact, I saw your comment in uh, on YouTube. So thank you very much. Uh, Kat liked them. Thank you very much indeed, Kat. And thank you for your support as a member. I like that. Lionheart, yes, you enjoyed it. Hello from Oklahoma City. Do you know, we've got a lot of Americans joining. I have thought about doing a another live talk, not um, as an alternative, not, not to replace this one. But I wonder whether to do a live talk in the in sort of late morning on a Friday coffee with Chris, not the same as this, we'll do something different, just to pick up some of the guys, I've got a fair few followers in Australia in particular, but also New Zealand, Hong Kong, um, don't know whether to do something like that, just so that those guys can join in, because I'm guessing over in the, in Australia now, it's probably hell's teeth, it's probably midnight-ish, isn't it, so probably not many of them are going to be joining in, but hey, it's great to see so many of you from North America on the call, uh, and, and then I've just seen aid. Hi from Belfast, Aid and Aid. Thank you for becoming a patron recently as well. Wow. Um, da -da -da, Harry, I really enjoyed both videos and found the Opium Wars to be so interesting. The one thing I found as I was researching the Opium Wars is they're a bit of a misnomer of a name because actually it involved a lot more than just opium. And of course, the you know and. Whilst the Chinese obviously didn't appreciate the British smuggling opium into their country, uh, it wasn't that opium was totally new. It wasn't like the British had, had discovered opium and brought it to China. It had been known in China for quite some time. Um, and, and in parts of China, it was being grown. So, um, and there was a lot more to it than just opium. But that's the easy thing to call it. And that's what, you know, that's what it's called. Um, but so, uh, yeah, interesting. And it did make me think that... You know, the British in the 19th century did have an arrogance, which maybe we don't have now. But I'd also call it they had a self-assurance that we don't have now either. There's a fine line between arrogance and self-assurance, isn't there, probably? 
But, um, you know, the Chinese were not some Stone Age settlement being overrun by the British. You know, they were a proud empire who had been around for thousands of years. The Chinese culture had been around a hell of a lot longer than English culture. And obviously, you know, the, the Chinese view of the world was very much it was centered on centered on China. And part of the problems, as I was reading it, is, is that you had basically, for want of a better phrase, arrogant British, 19th century British Empire, arrogant Chinese. And near the twain was ever going to meet. But it's interesting, I think, you know, I follow current affairs and I certainly don't believe that the Chinese um, have lost all of that attitude or certainly the political leadership in China. I think there's quite a lot, which is it's, you know, the world does centre a little bit around China in their thinking. And why not? Um, you know, it, we all view the world from our own perspectives, but it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Sarah Jane, you're going to email me what you found. Yes, please do. I'd be fascinated. You never know. There might be a story out of that, Sarah Jane. There's a guy I met down in Cornwall, actually, <laughs> just after I taken that photo. Um, family friend, family friend of Sarah's. Uh, had uh, served with her, her husband when he was alive. And um, uh, he'd actually got a letter from a member of his family who'd been a British prisoner of war of the Japanese in the Second World War. And he, would you believe, I mean, if being a Japanese prisoner of war wasn't bad enough, being taken to Japan wasn't bad enough. He was at Nagasaki when it was bombed. And, and he wrote his reminiscences of the, uh, he actually believed he saw a bomb he was with, on a parachute coming down uh and and he wasn't he couldn't get into the shelter but somehow he survived and um yeah fascinating so uh an amazing thing from just a normal normal british serviceman no, no one special per se apart from being a a man who was serving his country so and i'm thinking about doing a short story about that because you know that's amazing isn't it imagine imagine being there as a prisoner of war anyway um Lionheart, and if Wolsey hadn't been in the Sudan, would the general in charge have waited for the Canadian river men and delayed? Oh, great one, uh, Lionheart. Yes, because of course, Oswald, uh, Oswald Mosley, where am I going there? <laughs> St. Garnet Wolsey. Um, his, his big thing, obviously, was, you know, he knew about campaigns or expeditions on rivers because he'd done it on the Red River Expedition in Canada. So how hard could it be to go up the River Nile? Similar sort of thing. And, and of course, he waited for some of those Canadian boatmen to come over. Because, you know, use the people that you trust from the past. And in fairness, Garnet Wolsey was very good at using people that you trust in the past. But you're absolutely right, Lionheart. There was a major delay whilst they waited for these guys to be assembled in Canada and then brought all the way from Canada to uh, to UK and then on, on to Egypt and then down from Egypt to the, the forward base on the border of, of Sudan. And could they, have man could they have marched inland faster? Maybe. And history might have been very, very different. Um, yeah, if if that, yeah, it's it's uh, it, alternate history is great, but you can end up. It always leaves a big question: you know, what afterwards? Because if that had all happened, Lionheart, I guess fundamentally that yeah, the scramble for Africa would have been very different. Africa itself would be very different now. Britain would be different. Uh, it says, how far do you? Tr you know, it's like small small points. Little axes, you know, left or right, left or right. But it's uh, it's amazing uh, if you keep doing that, how far away you can go from in two different directions. Um, I read that there was nothing in Hong Kong when it was given to the British. Is that true? Um, there might have been a couple. I, think, I guess there were a few uh, few villages there, but no, there was no nothing major. It was not a major port like it is now, uh, or became. Yep. So you're, you're correct on that one, uh, Sonny Jim. Thank you. Uh, Harry Shreve, it sounds like the two toughest kids on the block eventually are going to have a fight. Yeah. Um, interesting one. Afternoon all. Yes, Grant, afternoon to you too. Louis Riel, Louis Riel in the Red River Rebellion has a holiday named after him, still celebrated by some provinces today. Thank you very much indeed, Dalton. I've covered the Red River ex uh, expedition and Riel's first rebellion in Canada. Some people have asked me whether I would do the Northwest Rising as well, which is his, his later uh, rebellion. And uh, yeah, and, and of course, some parts of Canada see him very much as almost like a freedom fighter. 
and other people see him as a rebel. And I say that quite often, don't I? But one person's one person's terrorist is someone else's freedom fighter. Um, so, uh, yet yeah, Neil Morrison, have you read the Forgotten Highlander POW work on Death Railway? No, I haven't, Neil. But thank you very much indeed for that. Um, and what I love with these conversations is people just uh, passing stuff on to me. Now, look, uh, part of the thing is we're supposed to be talking about uh, what's happened in British history this week. So let me kick off with Sunday the 3rd, or the, sorry, the 3rd of March, which happened to be Sunday this week. And I've actually got, I've got three things. Yeah, three things, key ones to, to share with you from the 3rd of March. So uh, let me let me whiz through them reasonably quickly, okay? 3rd of March, 1770, the Boston Massacre. This isn't, um, this is not Boston in Lincolnshire. This is Boston, Massachusetts, which of course at the time was a British colony. The, the, the 13 colonies were still very much ruled by Britain in 1770 and tensions had been rising for some time. And those of you who watched my first, first Opium War video might remember that um, uh, one of the future U.S. presidents, I think it was Quincy Adams, basically said that uh, that uh, the, the Opium War, Opium was as much uh, the cause of the Opium Wars as throwing the tea into Boston Harbor was the cause of the American Revolution. And, and certainly the American Revolution, you know, tensions build. And then you get to a tipping point. And uh, the Boston Massacre was one of those moments where the tension was building. A crowd... And it rather depends whether you call them a mob. Depends which side of the equation you're on, doesn't it? But uh, a crowd of very vociferous, potentially violent Bostonians confronted some British redcoats in Boston. Uh, as I say, the British probably would call them a mob. If you're an American patriot, you'd probably just call them a crowd of good citizens. But um, long and short, the British soldiers opened fire on the crowd and killed three of them, wounded eight, two of whom later died of their injuries. So this, again, helped raise the uh, raise, raise the tensions. In fact, the soldiers were put on trial. And what was really amazing was that they, they were put on trial. I, I seem to remember, I can't remember what the hell happened to them, actually. Nothing major. I can't remember if they were acquitted or they were given menial sentences. But here's the interesting thing. The soldiers were defended by none other than John Adams, founding father of the United States and future president of the USA. And the prosecution was led by his own brother, Samuel Adams. So that's a great, I mean, there's a film in that, isn't there? Hey, what a great film. Uh, because this is a, yeah, it, it, well, at the end of the day, we can't exactly say that John Adams was pro-British, can we? And yet he was defending the British soldiers. So there you go, uh, the, the Boston Massacre of 1770. And that just helped raise the tensions more and more in North America until eventually we had the American Revolution. Much more recent. Same date, 3rd of March, 3rd of March, 1941, the Bethnal Green tube station disaster. As many of you all know, during the Second World War, many tube stations in London were used as air raid shelters. Interestingly, many tube stations in Berlin were used as air raid shelters as well. Uh, on this particular date, 19, 3rd of March, 1941, air raid sirens sounded our crowds flocked to Bethnal Green tube station in East London and that someone tripped and there was a massive crush, crowd crush. 173 people, 173 people were killed, mainly suffocated in the ensuing crush, including 60 children. So a, a terrible tragedy which had nothing to do with the German bombs. Well, I guess they wouldn't have been going in there had there not been German bombers on their way. But uh, nothing, no one was actually killed by a German bomb. And that was a sad, sad moment in history, isn't it? Last one for the 3rd of March that I want to talk to you about is 1960. 3rd of March, 1960. Elvis Presley made his only official visit to Great Britain. He never performed here as a singer. But for two hours on the 3rd of March, 1960, he stopped at Prestwick Airport in Scotland uh, on his way home from doing his national service, his conscription in Germany, en route back to uh, back to uh, back to the states. Interestingly, there is a, a, a legend, rumor 
that Tommy Steele, English rock and roller, uh, had invited uh, Elvis to London and had toured, had driven Elvis around London. I've never seen any photographic evidence of that, but uh, that is one of the stories that does the rounds. That Elvis came here incognito. Um, could Elvis go anywhere incognito? That's hard to do, isn't it? I would have thought it's better like Winston Churchill turning up incognito, isn't it? Um, but there you go. Elvis, what we do know is the 3rd of March 1960, Elvis stopped off for two hours at Prestwick Airport, his only official visit to the UK. So there you go. So what's happening in the chat? Um, Jen Ingalls has asked, uh, was the Nile as difficult to navigate as Canadian water rivers? It was, Jen, only in, well, it, principally in the extent that there were a whole series of what they called cataracts, uh, otherwise known as rapids, which uh, that's principally why he wanted the boatmen, because they were really good at dealing with the rapids in, on the Red River expedition. So, um, yes, it was difficult. Obviously, a much, much longer river than, uh, the, than the Garnet Walsley had dealt with in Canada. But um, it was difficult and it continued to be difficult. Uh, Kitchener um, was confronted with the same problems in his campaign in the 1890s when he reinvaded uh, Sudan. And that's partly why he constructed his railway across the desert so that he didn't have to use the cataracts. Um, where are we at? Uh, Leslie just mentioned that one Japanese, Japanese businessman was in Hiroshima. He made it home to Nagasaki on the morning of the 9th of August. Wow, Leslie, we're talking about great films. I've just had the the um, the Adams Brothers uh, as a potential film. That, Leslie, has got to be an amazing film, hasn't it? What's the old expression? Jumping out of the frying pan into the fire? Imagine surviving Hiroshima and going home to Nagasaki. Um, awesome. Thank you very much for sharing that. Stephen Holmes, could I tell the story about one of Nottinghamshire's finest? Captain Albert Ball VC. Uh, Stephen, have a look on my channel. I did Albert Ball only about two weeks ago. So yes, I've done one. He's there. And while you're over there, if you're, if you're a bit of a fan of Nottingham, um, pop, keep scrolling down my, my, uh, my list of videos. There's a really good one about the Chilwell Munitions Factory explosion in 1918. Chilwell's just on the west side of Nottingham and a massive explosion on a summer's day. Basically, the um, uh, the, the the factory ignited because of the temperatures. Uh, a lot of lot of lot of uh, dead people. So anyway, uh, Edward Wheeler. I'm not a big fan of counterfactuals. I do enjoy reading the Queen and I and the Court Martial of George Armstrong Custer. Uh, rather like you, Edward. I I I enjoy them to an extent. But I think it's rather like a game of Jenga. You know, if you pull if you pull too many of the the the, the things out, everything afterwards collapses. Uh, Edward Wheeler, to be honest, it was a mob. Fair enough. We're talking about the Boston Massacre there, obviously. Um, thank you, Charlie, for mentioning about Stephen Holmes. Haven't seen your thing. Thank you very much. Um, Harry Shriver's saying it's a mob. Hey, good to see people on your side of the Atlantic saying that, Harry. Thank you. Uh I'm just racing down here. Sorry, folks. Terry, if Elvis was in uniform at the time, he might have got away with it. Uh, this is being incognito, being driven around by Tommy Steele in London. Yeah, good point, actually. Shaven head. Well, not shaven head, but, you know, army army haircut. Yeah, guess, guess, guess if he'd been in his rhinestone uh, Las Vegas outfit, it might have been slightly more difficult and shades, but, yeah. Um... I've sailed the Canadian Maritimes. Very dangerous. Thank you very much. Oh, Christopher Warren. Hi, Chris. I'm from Stoke-on-Trent, Staffordshire. Have I got a video for you coming out uh, at the end of this video, at the end of this chat? Okay, it's about one of Staffordshire's finest, not not Nottinghamshire's finest, Albert Ball. I've got a story, and this is might as well introduce you to it now. I've got a story coming up at the end of this video, and I'll take a bit of straw poll from everyone. Okay, so fingers on fingers on your on your keyboards. It is about it's the incredible story about a the pacifist who was awarded a Victoria Cross, Staffordshire's finest, William Coltman, VC, uh, and actually that's not his full title, VC, DCM and Bar, M and M and Bar, which is for those of you who don't know your military medals, Distinguished Conduct Medal. 
which you won twice. That's why you get a bar. It makes it, it says you won it twice. I've uh, been awarded it twice, sorry. And military medal twice. Came from Burton on Trent in Staffordshire. So there you go, Christopher, not, not far from you. And he joined the North Staffordshire Regiment. He volunteered for the North Staffordshire Regiment in the First World War. It was while he was on the Western Front, he was a very committed Christian, actually a member of the Plymouth Brethren. And he basically realized he heard the shouts, cries in the night of the wounded men out in no man's land. And I guess his Christian conscience started talking to him. And he basically realized he couldn't fire his rifle in anger and leave men like that or even if they were Germans, like that lying, crying in pain in no man's land. And so he asked to become a stretcher bearer. And he spent the rest of the war as a stretcher bearer. And in that capacity, as I say, he earned the Victoria Cross, two Distinguished Conduct Medals, two military medals. And I'm telling his story. The video is ready. It's all up. It's waiting for me just to go click. Um, and I was going to release it at two o'clock today. Actually, I think we're going to release it at 2.15 today. Let me just have a little look here. I've got a separate screen running. Hey, this is this is like being in Houston. And what I want to know from you folk, do I just release it so at the end of this we can say, over there, go and hunt for it? Or do we do a premiere where you can basically watch it like we're doing now and can comment as you go? So premiere or release? Okay. Um, please tell me, what would you like to do? Do I need to finish... But one, two o'clock so we can go premiere or uh, do you just want me to release it so you can come back to it later in the afternoon in your own good time? What do people think? Charlie Manson's gone for premiere. Uh, release, please, Chris. Do you know, whenever I ask these either or questions, <laughs> my my tribe love to go straight down the middle for me. Uh uh, Christopher, let me come back to you on that one. Uh, release more convenient. Okay, Veronica. Okay. So what I'm going to do, unless everyone starts to say premiere, please, I'm going to tell it not to be a premiere. There's a um, brilliant. Okay. And is there a good time that I need to release it for today, folks? I mean, do we go two o'clock? Do we do three o'clock? What's a good time for people? When would you like to watch it? When would you like it to be out and about for you? Um <laughs> Thank you, Jen. You would have liked to premiere, but you're out. So I think that means it's a release in your case. ASAP from Veronica. Well, I'll tell you what, folks, what I'm going to do is release. OK, thank you very much. OK. Three o'clock would be a good time. Yeah, OK. Uh, premiere with all the trumpets and fanfare of life of Brian. What have the Romans done for us? Thank you very much. Any time's good for Charlie. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. You really do love and appreciate my videos. Um, and I really appreciate all your, your support as well, folks. So, right. I will, I'm going to go. I'm going for, I'm going for releasing it at two o'clock. How about that? But it won't be a premiere. It'll just be there. So you won't be able to comment. Well, you can comment. You know, you can do your comments like so many of you do anyway, but just not. Um, but just uh, we won't be having live commentary like this and me typing back as we go. Is that all right for folk? Um, and good morning, James, over there in Houston, Texas. Lovely to see you. So, James, you've just missed our Boston Massacre. A quick nod to the Americans and indeed Elvis Presley's first uh, only official visit to the UK while he was in doing national service. So let me move on. Uh, the 4th of March, 1851, Hector MacDonald is, uh, is born. Hector MacDonald, many of you know, great Victorian warrior, a crofter's son who rose all the way to become a general in the Victorian army, which is pretty unheard of in the Victorian army. He, he was really, uh, he was very much the exception rather than the rule. So, um, and of course, his, his big moment. He was raised from the ranks at the Battle of Kandahar in Afghanistan by Lord Roberts. Lord Roberts was so impressed with his, his conduct and his bravery, he offered him a commission. And uh, that's how he became an officer. Of course, his, his real high point was during the Battle of Omdurman in Sudan, when uh, led by Lord Kitchener against the Khalifa's army. And basically, Kitchener had devastated the Mahdi, uh, the, the, the Mahdist army, the Khalifa's army, 
and decided that uh, with undue haste, he was now going to march on the city of Omdurman, just a little way away, so that the Mahdist forces couldn't regroup in Omdurman. What he didn't want to have was basically house-to-house uh, -house fighting in Omdurman, even against the Mahdists, who many of them were armed with Remington rifles, and indeed, obviously, they had spears. If you've seen the, the Mahdist spears, they were big. You don't want to be in a hand-to-hand -hand fight with those guys if you could possibly help it. So he, uh, he basically assembled the army, started moving towards Omdurman, and uh, basically, part of the Mardist army had well, was behind a hill and swept round. And Hector MacDonald basically manoeuvred his Sudanese troops. He was commanding a whole group of black Sudanese troops. Uh, there were a lot of Sudanese actually in the Egyptian army, uh, people obviously who didn't support the Mardist cause. And uh, he wheeled them to face, uh, to face uh, the, the first attack. They actually came in two attacks. He wheeled them to face the first attack basically blasted away, defeated that attack, and then he wheeled his whole his whole unit round completely the other way to face the next attack. And um, whether it saved Kitchener's army, maybe is too big a point, maybe too big a push, but certainly the Battle of Omdurman would not have been quite the walkover that it turned out to be had Hector MacDonald not done that. And a lot of people at the time were really praising Hector MacDonald the only person who seemed to really take umbrage was Lord Kitchener himself. Um, so uh, yeah, he, he wasn't he wasn't massively pleased with Hector Macdonald. Anyway, so Hector Macdonald, I've done a video all about him. So have a have, have a look. It ends up it's a sad ending actually, sad ending. But um, that's in, in my that's in my playlist. Released oh gosh, eighteen months ago now probably. Been very popular. Of course, he came from Scotland. Um, Neil up, uh, I think he was from Dingwall area. He has a Hector MacDonald uh, monument there. The other um, other famous person that I've talked about in the past, also on this day, uh, the 4th of March. 4th of March, 1932. James Reynolds, VC, died. Better known to those of you who follow the Zulu Wars, or in particular who watch the film Zulu, as Surgeon Reynolds. Surgeon Reynolds at the defence of Rourke's Drift in the in the in the in the Zulu War was awarded a Victoria Cross. He obviously kept uh, he he was running the hospital there and kept uh, patching up the wounded men all through the night, um, mainly using the light of the burning hospital. He obviously retreated out of the hospital by then. Uh, the Zulus had set the hospital on fire, and actually that he performed operations under sort of a, the the firelight. From the hospital. So there you go. Uh, they did a mini series on John Adams in 2008. Oh, okay. They did a whole episode on the trial of the Boston Massacre. Thank you, Terry, for that one, by the way. Um, let me move on though. 4th of March, 1824, the Royal National Lifeboat Institute was formed. I thought we'd do something that didn't involve battles and things. All right. So the RNLI was formed in uh, 4th of March, 1824. It was formed by, it was established by a man called Sir William Hillary. And since its inception in 1824, it is credited with saving the lives of something like 140,000 people off the coasts of Britain. It's totally voluntary. There are 40,000 volunteers manning something like 238, I think it is, stations in, in the, around the, the coasts of Britain. Uh, 40,000 volunteers, 600 Volunteer members of the RNLI have lost their lives since it was established trying to rescue other people at sea. Um, so there you go. And um, yeah, a bit of a bit of a British institution. They say that it's uh, considering that it's principally at the coastline, uh, a lot of you know bequeathments and things come from people who live right in the middle of England uh, in inland areas. So it's one of those, I think it's one of those things that most Brits, we all have a bit of a knowledge, maybe it's because we're an island nation, but we all, no matter where we live, there's a bit of a soft spot for the RNLI. Uh, funny enough, last year when I was in Tembe, I saw the saw the lifeboat being launched. It was pretty spectacular when you see it come down the runway, or runway down, down, the, down the causeway and, and hit the water. Um, but remember, all those people are, are volunteers and putting their lives at risk. So there you go. One of the guys I used to row with was also on the uh, uh, on the RNLI station up at who was it West Kirby on the Wirral. But there you are. Um, this is a <laughs> this is uh, Jen. 
are in a line. This is my cue for a cheer for Henry Blog. Jen, you and I have talked about Henry Blog in the past, and I can't remember what it was about. Um, so put anything in you want if you want to type away. OK, um, so right. Let's move on quickly. And oh, no, let me just quickly see what else everyone is saying. Release, release, release. Yeah. OK, fine. We've done some of that stuff. We talked to James, Chris Warren, uh, Christopher Warren. Love both videos on Taco Forts. Thank you. Um, OK, we're all. <laughs> Thank you very much. Right. 5th of March, 1811, the Battle of Barossa in the Peninsular War during the Napoleonic Wars. A very, very quick background that uh, initially the Spanish had been allies with, uh, with, with, with France. But in the late eight, eight tens, sorry, eight tens, before eight ten, the um, after the Battle of Trafalgar, basically in eighteen oh five, uh, the Spanish had tried to change sides, and f the French had invaded, taken over the, uh, tried to take over the whole of the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal, and of course, uh, famously, Napoleon put his brother on the throne of France, uh, on the throne of Spain. Um, so technically, Spain was an ally again. But obviously, a lot of Spaniards uh, didn't see it quite that way. And there were many armed, uh, the, the, there was a royalist, a loyalist Spanish army fighting against uh, Napoleon, but they're, or they're fighting against the French, shall I say. And uh, there was also, of course, partisans um, who were called guerrillas, guerrillados. Um, and um, that's where the word guerrilla, guerrilla warfare comes from. So uh, as much as the Boers might like to uh, claim it was theirs, it, it wasn't. It came from the, the Peninsula Wars. Anyway, the British and Spanish were holed up in Cadiz, the main Spanish naval port, uh, and um, they're surrounded by the French on the mainland. French had released, uh, had weakened their defences slightly, but were still in commanding position. So it was agreed between the British and Spanish that they would take some of their forces from Cadiz, land further down the uh, coast at um, uh, Tarifa, and would march effectively, come, come at the, the French lines from inland. Uh, the French were wise to that. They prevented a breakout, simultaneous breakout from Cadiz. And then uh, Marshal Victor, the French uh, general, led uh, basically prepared an ambush for the British-Spanish force. The Spanish marched in there and were trying to force a way, uh, find a way towards Cadiz. The British were bringing up the rear under uh, General uh, Thomas Graham. They had just left the Barossa Bridge, uh, Ridge, and uh, the French occupied it, and they were about to be cut off and, and um, attacked from their own rear. Graham turned his forces round, and basically they scaled the Barossa Ridge and inflicted a major defeat on the French. Um, in this battle, famously, the 87th Regiment, who later became the Royal Irish Regiment, captured the very first French eagle that was captured by the British in the uh, the the Napoleon uh, sorry the the Peninsula Wars uh, Ensign Keo Ensign was the like the most junior officer rank normally a teenager tried to grab it uh, but he was killed and uh, a sergeant Sergeant Patrick uh, Masterson grabbed it instead held on to it fighting off all comers the French obviously wanted to get their eagle back and he allegedly shouted the great line uh, for Jesus boys I've got the cuckoo which, uh, even if you didn't say it, it's just one of those lines that, you know, to describe the, the French eagle as a cuckoo is just fantastic. And, and he deserves to be known for that one, even if he never said it. Um, it could have been a major disaster for the French at this stage. The tables have been turned, but the Spanish refused to reinforce Graham. And Graham basically became a stalemate. And uh, the whole idea of breaking out of Cadiz failed. And uh, Graham was furious with the Spanish for not giving him the forces, bringing their forces up to take the battle to the retreating French. Uh, but that's the Battle of Barossa in the Spanish, in the Napoleonic Wars, in the Peninsular Wars, uh, in 18, 5th, of, 5th of March, 1811. And 5th of March, 1946, before I come back to the comments, uh, 5th of March, 1946, Winston Churchill, we can never, can never get away from him, can we, in these talks? Winston Churchill delivered his famous Iron Curtain speech at Fulton University, Missouri. Uh, so and that's where he basically, and I won't do the Churchill accent, okay, but you always want to. It's, um, but he said basically, you know, across Europe, 
uh, an iron curtain has descended from Tria uh, from st set in in the north to Trieste in the south. An iron curtain has come down across Europe, and behind it are many of the ancient capitals of Europe, and in places like Budapest and Prague and Warsaw. So, um, and that's where the term, the Iron Curtain, came from, coined by the one and only Winston Churchill. So there we go. I'm going to just turn over my notes just to make sure I've got a few things and make sure we don't overrun because at two o'clock, it would be nice for some of you to go and see my video if you want. Um, oh, by the way, when I say notes, that's it. Uh, rest assured that when I do my video, not least of William Coltman, BC, uh, there's a bit more of a script to it than that. But and that's why these are different. But there you go. So um, Uncle Heavy, message retracted. Ooh, don't know where that was going there, mate. Uh, Goya's paintings of the Spanish patriots are stunning, says Edward Wheeler. Yeah, there are actually. And and it's one of those ones, actually, Edward, that when you see them, if, if I now did a, a talk about, you know, the, the Goya's paintings, you a lot of you would be like, oh, that painting. Because um, that's certainly how I found it. You know, when I suddenly realised that actually some of these were all about the Peninsula War, or well, the, the war in Spain. And of course, they just on that Peninsula War, but of course, ultimately, under the Duke of Wellington, the British were victorious. They, they well, the British and Spanish, Spanish liberated the country, British, a fair bit of British help there. And uh, eventually the British were to cross the Pyrenees and enter France itself in 1814, Battle of Toulouse. And really it was that, that crossing, um, as well as Prussians and Austrians and Russians starting to enter France in the east, uh, and Wellington coming now from the south, that uh, led to Napoleon's downfall in 1814 and his, his exile, or at least for 100 days, uh, to Elba. And then, of course, he returned from Elba, because uh, that's only just just out in the Mediterranean, is it, in near Corsica? And he returned and he had, uh, sorry, 100 days. Then he had his 100 days reign, reign in in um, in France, where it all ended at Waterloo. So his big comeback lasted 100 days. But there you go. Um, Leslie, at Westminster Chapel in Fulton, Missouri, in the Christopher Wren Chapel. Is that where he delivered the speech? In the Christopher Wren Chapel at Fulton University, Missouri. Thank you very much indeed, Leslie, for that. James, Gar uh, James Garman, are there still British or European graves from the Victorian era still in China? I don't know. Does anyone else know? Um, I'm not sure. Um, if, 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 if they're no longer there, I would think it's as much to do with development and redevelopment as it would be from any nationalist sentiment. But um, again, I stand to be corrected. Anyone who's travelled to China, anyone who's worked in China, please, please, please help uh, James with his uh, with his question. Are there still British or European graves from the Victorian era in China? And there's certainly a lot of Victorian uh, graves in that era in British India. Well, not British India, India. Um, but uh, then I guess there were a lot more of them as well. Not most of them, not particularly well kept. But then, joking apart, vegetation grows very fast in India. Uh, it grows reasonably fast in graveyards in Britain if you don't keep on top of them. So imagine what it's like in India. So again, um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> a friend of mine was serving with Sharp when he took the eagle. Thank you very much indeed. Um, right, let's move on, folks. 6th of March, 1426. Stephen says the VC graves were there. They were lost during the Cultural Revolution, I'm guessing. Maybe, maybe. Don't know. Um, right, 6th of March, 1426, the Battle of St. James. Doesn't that sound good? It was actually in the Hundred Years' War. It was a battle, just to go back a bit in time, it was a battle between the uh, French and the English. That's what the, the Hundred Years' War was principally all about. And this battle was fought on the boundary or the borders basically between Normandy, which was under British control, and Brittany, which had recently uh, changed sides and was now supporting France. Uh, it was an English victory, but ultimately it didn't uh, it didn't reverse the tide of the Hundred Years' War. The Hundred Years' War eventually went France's way, didn't it? Famously, that at the end of the Hundred Years' War, uh, the only bit of France that the English still had was the Port of Calais, which they kept for another 100 years or so. Here's something slightly different. 
6th of March, 1725. Henry Benedict Stewart is born. Now, <laughs> you're probably thinking, who the hell is Henry Benedict Stewart? And some of you, you uh, in my members channel, you'll know that you've had access recently to the long talk I did, uh, a live talk about, uh, and I've recorded it, about the House of Stuart, or at least the House of Stuart as monarchs of Britain, or monarchs of England, rather than tracing all their lineage back in Scotland. And here's the clue in the name, Henry Benedict Stuart. The Stuarts end up in, uh, in, in British history with uh, James II being turfed off the throne. Uh, but, well, actually, this is the long story. James II was turfed off the throne by his daughter, Mary, and her son, uh, William of Orange, who became King William III. Uh, when they died, childless, their sister, or Mary's sister, sorry, Anne, became Queen Anne, first monarch of Great Britain, uh, because Scotland and England politically united during her reign. And when she died, the only Stuarts left, well, James II, remember, he'd been turfed off the throne because he was a Catholic. He was actually turned off the, turfed off the throne, not so much because he was a Catholic per se, but because Protestants have basically said, well, we don't like a Catholic king of England, but he's got a Catholic daughter, Mary, who's married to the Catholic William of Orange from the Netherlands. And she's got a Catholic sister. Uh, sorry. And uh, what am I talking about? Mary's a Protestant. He's a Catholic. King James. Mary's a Protestant. She's married to the Protestant William, William of Orange. And Mary's sister, Anne, is also a Protestant. So in classic British fudge it uh, way, look, just kick it down the road. When James dies, you know, we'll put up with a bit of Catholic monarch for the time being. But when he dies, uh, one of the girls is going to become monarch. And good times are back. England's back to being a Protestant country. The uh, It all went a bit belly up because uh, James had married again. Mary and Anne's wife had, uh, mother had died. And James had married. Wife had had a load of miscarriages, Mary of Madonna. But eventually she had a son. James Francis Stuart. James Francis Stuart later became known as the Old Pretender. And it was his birth that galvanised the Protestant majority in England to call Mary and William, William and Mary, to come over and lead what was called the Glorious Revolution in England and kick James off the throne because they did not want a Catholic dynasty to be established. And the laws of succession in England meant that this little baby James, James Francis, would have inherited the throne over his two older sisters. Okay, so that, that, that's the long and short glorious revolution in a tiny nutshell. And that's covered in my talk that people in my membership channel have got access to and a lot more. Uh, when Queen Anne died, they passed a law. It had actually been passed by William of Orange. Uh, Parliament passed a law to say that the throne could not go to a Catholic and they had to hunt around and find a, an alternative. The alternative was actually over in the long lost relatives in the House of Hanover in Germany. And that's how we got the House of Hanover coming on the throne of Britain. George I, George II, George III for my American friends over there. Yes, that George III, um, uh, King George. Uh, and then it dropped down to the Prince Regent, George IV, William IV, his brother, and then William's niece, Victoria. That's how it all sort of panned out. So. All good, well and good, bar the fact that little baby James, James Francis, was still alive and well, wasn't he? And many people said, no, why the hell have we gone all the way over to the Germans? We've got our homegrown prince here. And his dad was turfed off the throne. So actually, he's the rightful heir. And so James Francis uh, certainly believed he was the, the rightful king of Britain, Great Britain, he was called the old pretender because he had pretensions to be on the throne. His son, Charles Edward Stuart, raised a rebellion on his behalf in 1745, otherwise known as Bonnie Prince Charlie. Uh, and obviously he believed that he, when his father died, was the rightful heir to the British throne. He was the claimant called the young pretender. Henry Benedict Stuart was Bonnie Prince Charlie's younger brother. Born in 1725, Bonnie Prince Charlie was born in 1720. So James uh, Henry Benedict Stuart is the grandson of the deposed James II. Henry Benedict Stuart was the last of the Stuarts to officially claim that he was the King of Britain. 
There are obviously descendants still to this day, but none of them claim that they lay a claim to the throne of Great Britain. Henry Benedict Stuart did. Obviously, he did when his older brother, Bonnie Prince Charlie, finally died. Um, in the meantime, however, Henry Benedict Stuart actually became a Catholic priest. Ch uh, Bonnie Prince Charlie, by the way, when he was desperately still trying to, after Culloden and everything, when he still said, yeah, but I lost Culloden, but I am the, the rightful heir, uh, rightful king of Britain. He really opposed his brother becoming a Roman Catholic priest, purely on political grounds. It was like the whole reason that granddad lost his throne was because of being a Catholic. OK, uh, we've got to try and convince the Protestants of England and also the Protestants of Scotland that uh, and indeed some Protestants in Ireland as well, uh, that well, we are going to be. Uh, yeah, we are bona fide. Uh, we're not going to have some Catholic crusade against Protestants in Britain. So what the hell are you doing becoming a blinking Catholic priest? Um, nevertheless, and funny, funny enough, actually, Bonnie Prince Charlie, who was initially a Catholic, uh, converted to Anglicanism. Um, later on in his life in an attempt to, to appease the Protestants in England. Henry Benedict Stuart had none of that. He uh, became a, a Catholic priest and ended up being a cardinal. And this is where history gets great. In the French Revolution, one of the, uh, the main things that the, uh, the, 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 the French revolutionaries were against was, of course, the church. And here we had Henry Benedict Stuart. Oh, the other thing they were against was the aristocracy, wasn't it? The aristos and, and, the, and the, the royal family. So... They seized all of Henry Benedict Stuart's properties in France. And, uh, you know, the, he was a member of a royal family and also a Catholic, a priest. Uh, didn't really save him too much. And suddenly Cardinal Henry Benedict Stuart was destitute, uh, had no cash. And this is where history has a brilliant turn. The King of Britain, George III, yep. George III of American independence fame, everyone over the water there. George III of the House of Hanover, who Henry Benedict Stuart's brother had led a revolt against, the Jacobite Rebellion, Battle of Culloden. George III gave Henry Benedict Stuart a pension so that he wasn't destitute for the rest of his life. How about that stipend of, I think it's £4,000, which is a fair bit of cash back in uh, back in the 1790s. Uh, Henry Benedict Stuart ultimately died in 1807. Childless, of course, because he's a Catholic priest, or officially childless anyway. Uh, so there you go. Uh, I just thought that's a, that's a great little story, isn't it, of, of the Stuarts. Anyway, I've gone down a massive rabbit hole. So are there, we're going to go to Raymond, as a kid in the 60s in Gibraltar, I used to find cannonballs quite often from the siege of Gibraltar. And I had them on our, ca our balcony until my mother thought the, the weight would collapse. <laughs> the great story, Raymond. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Sean. True story. Was heavy, uh, this is Sean Bean, I guess, was heavily into reenacting and volunteered. Is that, is that right, Sean? You're talking about... Are we talking about Sean Bean being into reenactments? Um, say yes or no, just my curiosity. Was Fortress Calais reoccupied following D Day? Uh, ultimately, yes, wasn't part of the D Day landings, Leslie, but yeah, Calais, Calais surrendered. Uh, ironically, of course, the only bit that didn't surrender is the, is the British swept through France and sorry, and the Canadians and the Americans too, and the Free French. Yeah, it's not, not, let's not forget them. Um, the only bit that didn't get re, uh, reoccupied was the Channel Islands. Uh, which had been heavily fortified under Hitler's orders on the belief that the Channel Islands, part of Britain, or at least of British territory, uh, the British would, from a PR perspective, want to seize them back. He heavily fortified them, and the Allies, including the British, basically said, well, <laughs> we'll leave them to stew. So uh, on VE Day, that's when the, the Channel Islands finally surrendered to, to the Allies, or to the British, actually. Um, but yeah, yeah. Um, Thank you, Charlie, for saying, remember to hit the like, like button. Charles Edward Stuart Kieran's Charles Edward Stuart is always portrayed as having a Scottish accent, whereas in reality he had an Italian accent, just as Mary, Queen of Scots, actually had a French accent. You're Bob on there, Kieran. Uh, and it's one of those great, it's one of those narratives, isn't it? That, uh, you yeah, know, yeah, Mary, Queen of Scots lived most of her life in France. So she would definitely not have had a Scottish accent. And likewise, Charles Edward Stuart. Um, 
Charles Edward Stuart had never actually been to Scotland until he landed to raise the Jacobite rebellion in 1745. So he'd spent 25 years never setting foot in Scotland. So the chances of Charles Edward Stuart suddenly adopting a Scottish accent is, uh, would let's go for zero. Yeah. Uh, and of course, never forget that Charles Edward Stuart, whilst he made a lot of promises in Scotland about Scottish independence, and of course, a lot of Scots didn't want to be united with, with England in this Great Britain. Don't forget, uh, Charles Edward Stuart's ultimate aim was to get the throne of England, the crown of England on his head or on his dad's head. The old pretender was still alive at that stage. Um, it wasn't necessarily a Scottish independence bid. That's not the way the story is often told, but that, that's the reality. Charles Edward Stuart, uh, in the nicest way, was willing to sacrifice a lot of Highland blood uh, to get the throne of England. Um, British American George III was actually a very decent, thoughtful, and intelligent man prior to losing his mind. Yeah, and an incredible loving family. I went to Kew Gardens last last year, actually last summer, and Kew Palace, where they used to live. They spent most of the time at Kew Palace, and it was almost like a little rural ideal down by the down by the River Thames, away from the big palaces and the big smoke of London. Um, and of course, he was known as Farmer George because he spent so much time actually, you know, tending animals and interested in farming and horticulture, which is interesting, of course, because in many respects, Queen Elizabeth II, you know, loved the countryside uh, and was never happier than being, you know, with her horses, walking the countryside and indeed being a member of the, the Women's Institute, the WI, up near Sandringham in Norfolk. So, yeah, we, sometimes we forget that. But George, George III, a very interesting monarch. But don't forget, reigned for 60 years. So third longest reigning monarch in British history behind Queen Elizabeth II and Queen Victoria. Um, Jen sort of say, sadly got to go. Great crack, Chris. Thank you very much. Yes, you'll see me again next week, no doubt. Sean Palmer, uh, my wife's ex-husband was heavily into dressing up at weekends for reenactments and found himself volunteered for service with Sean Bean. Well, I never knew Sean Bean, AKA Sharp from the, the Sharp uh, TV series was into reenactments, um, but there you go. It all went hill. <laughs> Thank you very much. Right, let me finish off for you guys because we're video's about to go live. Um, and actually, interestingly, finishes off quite nicely. Well, actually, it's two. It finishes off quite nicely on um, 8th of March, uh, 1702. William III, William of Orange, who we've just been talking about, William and Mary, died. Uh, so he was born in uh, 1650. Uh, his mother, interestingly, was the sister of Charles II and James II, who just had kicked off the throne. OK, so she married the Prince of Orange, Netherlands, and they had the son, William, who became the Stadtholder, which is almost like the, the leader of the, uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to describe, but it, it, he was almost like the, the, the leader of, of the Netherlands. But he wasn't the leader. It, it didn't quite work like that. But he was the Stadtholder of the Netherlands, the Dutch Republic. Um, so great Protestant hope came over, helped depose uh, James II. Interestingly, uh, he was actually, th initially, he was third in line to the English throne. People forget that. We all talk about William of Orange was this foreigner who basically led a foreign invasion of, of, of England. Um, he actually was in the line of succession because of his mum. So until that little baby James had been born, when James II was the King of England and King of Scotland and King of Ireland, he wore three crowns, um, well, three separate, separate states at that stage, the, um, the line of succession was Protestant Mary, his daughter, Protestant Anne, his daughter, Protestant nephew, William of Orange, who just happened to marry his cousin, a... Good, isn't it? Um, then they never had kids. Probably a good idea. Good, good thing they didn't have kids, actually. But, um, but yeah. So, uh, so that's how William of Orange fitted in. He and Mary became joint monarchs, the only joint monarchs in British history or in English history. And um, and she died in the 1690s. He continued to reign as William III in his own right. He died in 1702. Died in pneumonia, but uh, pneumonia from complications of falling off his horse. And supposedly the horse had stumbled on a in a, on a in, in a molehill, and thrown fallen thrown him thrown William uh, he'd broken some bones, and the pneumonia was a, 
the uh, complication from that. The horse had supposedly been taken from a Jacobite supporter, someone who supported James II, the deposed king. And uh, the myth came that this horse basically gave, James, uh, gave William his comeuppance. And Jacobites used to toast the, uh, the, the little man wearing the velvet waistcoat, uh, which was their reference to the little mole who dug that hole, uh, which William's horse had fallen on. So uh, there you go. That was James, uh, uh, James the th uh, William III dying in 8th of March, 1702. And the very last one, I got to just drop back one day, 7th of March, 1902, the Battle of Tui Bosch during the, in the Boer War, Second Anglo-Boer War. Uh, Coups de la Rey led a Boer raiding party uh, that uh, ambushed Lieutenant General, General Lord Methuen. Methuen, you might have come across in one of my previous stories. He was the general in charge of the disastrous British battle at uh, Magus Fontaine, Magus Fontaine in, um, on the march initially in what was Black Week in 1899. Somehow he'd managed to retain, after that disaster, he still managed to retain his military position. He was still in South Africa, hadn't been sent home in disgrace or anything like that. And he, uh, we we're only just, just a month before the Boers entered negotiations with the British to end the Boer War. Coups de la Rey, one of the great Boer uh, guerrilla commanders, uh, ambushed him. Twice he, had, he ambushed his, his force. His Boer force was 2,000. Methuen's was about 1,000. Methuen's force was principally green soldiers, as in untried soldiers. They panicked at the, the ferocity of the Boer attack. And uh, something like 200 British casualties, uh, about something like 60 killed, 120 wounded, something like that. Uh, but equally, 200 British captured, including Lord Methuen himself. His horse had fallen, actually fallen on him, broken his leg. And uh, Coups de la Rey, and this is one of these interesting things, some of the Boer commanders, incredible gentlemen, considering the ferocity of that war. Uh, but Coups de la Rey put him in his own cabinet, kept Methuen in his own carriage, and sent him under a flag of truce to the nearest British garrison at Krugersdorp in, in, in Transvaal. And uh, yeah, Methuen, Methuen was you know, nursed back to health. And amazingly, even after that defeat at uh, Tweebosch, he managed to somehow come out smelling of roses. He ended up becoming ultimately um, governor of Natal colony, as it still was in South Africa, just before uh, the Union of South Africa was created in 1910. He... Uh, he then he was raised, ultimately became a field marshal and finished the war in uh, during the First World War. Sorry, finished uh, he during the First World War. He was governor of Malta in the Mediterranean. Finally finished off his life, 1990, 1920, sorry, became the um, constable of the Tower of London, a position he held till he died in the early 1930s. Interestingly, he took over as constable of the Tower of London from uh, Sir Evelyn Wood. Who I've done a video about the one of Wolseley's shanty ring of officers uh, and previous uh, previous constables of the tower include the Duke of Wellington and Charles Cornwallis, who had two notorieties really. One was that he was the British commander at Yorktown when the British surrendered in the, to George Washington in the American War of Independence, uh, and then it went on to become Governor General of India for the East India Company. Um, so another another general who managed to come out smelling of roses, because most, most folk, if you'd surrendered to George Washington at Yorktown and basically lost the American War of Independence, uh, you don't get given a plummet position like Governor General of India. But somehow Cornwallis did, didn't he? So there you go. So, folks, um, that's me for this week. Uh, Invisible Ray, evening troops. <laughs> uh, Invisible Ray, a fan of Flashman, and uh, I love the George MacDonald Fraser books, Flashman. Uh, if I could have, if I could write a book about history, I wish George MacDonald Fraser hadn't had the idea of Flashman, because I probably would have gone down a route. Probably nowhere near as good as George MacDonald Fraser, I hasten to add. But the idea of weaving that history into stories, but with that real comic Flashman take on it is, is amazing. Um, great books, a bit rude sometimes, um, but uh, um, yeah, probably not books I'd recommend to my daughter, but to my son, maybe. Uh, so anyway, folks, that's an end of a gallop through British history this week. I hope you've enjoyed it. And if you want a bit more of the history chap, 
go on to my channel now because uh, right now we have uploaded it is live and live and kicking or at least i hope it has it's live and kicking we have william coltman bc the pacifist who was awarded the victoria cross in world war one he actually ended up as the most decorated other rank in other words not an officer other rank British soldier of the First World War, which is pretty damn impressive for a pacifist, don't you think? And if you're intrigued as to what this man was about and what drove him to become a stretcher bearer, because I'll tell the story of stretcher bearers in, in, the, in this video as well. And if you think that it is a cushy number, you know, get out of shooting and fighting Germans, think again. Because whilst most of the British Tommies with their rifles were in a trench, the stretcher bearers were out in no man's land finding the wounded and just because you had a little white thing on your white arm badge with sb written on it didn't really uh, offer you much protection from german snipers german machine guns and sure as hell not from german artillery uh, and probably every now and then from british artillery too um so go over have a look at william coltman staffordshire's finest uh, and uh, so thank you ever so much for joining me today have a brilliant weekend when you get uh, whenever it arrives for you wherever you are in the world thank you to all my american fans who've joined me today uh, as well as all my british fans and indonesia I, I yeah thank you everyone but um i enjoy it and uh, let's let's have more of these live talks i'm gonna think how we do these because i i thoroughly enjoy them hope you do too and it would be lovely to have live talks where maybe we just pick one topic, like um, some stuff about the, the American War of Independence would be a really interesting one. The American Revolution, the Revolutionary Wars, however you want to describe it. Uh, I'd love to have a discussion as well, not least with some of my Australian and New Zealand fans about um, fans, viewers, whatever you call but uh, but uh, about, about uh, Gallipoli and, and the whole the psyche that you know the the impact it had and why it had the impact it had in australia and new zealand because yeah I really just love to understand it actually uh, and the stories that come from there some from some incredibly brave men who served in they didn't just serve the australians and new zealand didn't just serve in gallipoli uh, we forget that massive presence in uh, egypt and moving into uh, through the gaza strip into Palestine. So there you go. Um, thank you very much indeed, folks. Uh, I'll leave that one simmering and think about that. Have a great weekend. See you soon. I hope you really enjoy the video about William Coltman, uh, the pacifist who was awarded the Victoria Cross. Enjoy. When you're over there, give me a thumbs up, share it with your friends uh, and, uh, and make a comment. YouTube like all of those things I hasten to add, okay? Thumbs up, comments, shares. That gets me up, up the YouTube algorithm, which is what the whole game is about, folks, uh, as well as because I want to share British history and my love of British history and the stories from British history with as many people as possible uh, who might enjoy just sitting back and hearing history told by a human being and not a, an AI computer. And believe you me, it's happening out there now. Uh, told by a real human being who maybe uh, if we can't meet up physically, at least we can meet up in sessions like this. Thank you very much for joining me. Uh, take care. Keep well. See you very soon.